And with this, I will switch to English and I welcome you all to my presentation um, on order liberal influences on European competition law. And as you can see from the title, this is quite an interdisciplinary project. I try to combine here legal and economic history with EU law studies and with the methods of digital humanities. So it's always difficult for me to find an audience that is interested in, in my topic and in my methods. And I'm really grateful that I can present today here in this setting because I will finally meet people um, that are interested in my methods and, and I will therefore place the emphasis also on the methods and less on the empirical results in this presentation. But before I start, I would like to make uh, two uh, small points. First, I thought it might be helpful to say a little bit what is competition law, because I'm not presenting here in front of lawyers, but in front of historians. So historically, competition law um, was established as, as part of the fight against cartels and monopolies. Um, so cl classical questions, for instance, deal with um, charging too high prices for a product or for collud colluding with a competitor. And you try to protect consumers by using this law um, to, to sanction this kind of behavior. And modern competition law has a bit developed and it now also encompasses merger control. So you can um, check if two large firms try to merge and, and form an even larger firm, because that might have repercussions for the competition on this market. And it also includes state aid control, which means that the law is able to check if some subsidies given by national governments might impede the functioning of competition uh, in the European common market. So these are the four pillars of competition law. And I will tell a little bit about each of these pillars in, in the course of the presentation. And the second point I would like to, to raise um, right at the beginning is that um, I present today the final chapter of the thesis, the quantitative part in which I use um, a couple of digital methods. Um, but this is just a part of the thesis. And um, also I will, I will place much emphasis now on quantitative estimates. This is not to say that I think this is the only thing we should do as historians. It's, it's meant to be a complement to the traditional qualitative analysis. And the previous part of my PhD thesis engages with a lot of archival work. It deals with the secondary literature and it conducts a lot of traditional qualitative analysis to see what kind of influences of order liberal scholars can we really detect in the negotiation of the treaties, in the application of the competition norms, and in the discussion um, by, by academics. Um, but today, as I said, I will, I will focus on this quantitative final part, which is just the end of the story in a sense, and tries to present an aggregate, an aggregate analysis. So in the written version of this, of this chapter, you, refer, you would find a lot of cross-references to other chapters. Before outlining my talk in, in a bit more detail, I just want to give you uh, straight away the three takeaways from this chapter. So first of all, um, um, I constructed a new corpus um, for this anal analysis, which um, captures uh, all of European competition law right to this day. So I scraped the website of the European Commission, um, which includes all the decisions handed out by the Commission and all the judgments by the European Court when these decisions have been appealed. And overall, these are about 11,000 observations. And the important part is that for all of these observations, I have the full text. So not only information on the specific firm that was targeted or the specific abuse, but I have the whole text, how the commission argued, how the court argued. And this is of course key for applying text mining methods or corpus linguistic methods, I have called it in, in the title of this presentation. And this whole database covers um, the four pillars of competition law that I just described to you. So it starts with cartels and dominant positions and say that because this was included in the first treaty, um, the Rome Treaty of 1957, but it also includes merger control, which was only added later. And as I just said, it also captures the whole period of the law's application. <clears throat> The second point is that I try to make a methodological contribution. I know that in, in this setting here, most people are familiar with corpus linguistic methods, but in the history of European integration and specifically in the 
um, historiography on European competition law, these methods have so far not been used at all. These are all qualitative discussions, mostly by lawyers, sometimes by political scientists, but there is no use um, of any digital humanities methods so far. So in a sense, I propose to, to go from a text as text approach to a text as data approach. This is done in a, in a lot of different settings now, and I try to do this for the specific area of European competition law history. And as you will see in a minute, I use a, a, a broad um, range of methods. And, and uh, in this presentation today, I, I would like to focus on this methodological contribution. Nonetheless, of course, this chapter also makes an empirical contribution, trying to contribute to this debate on what is the goal, what is the intellectual influences behind European competition law. And as I will argue in a minute, we can say that the first three decades of European competition law were strongly influenced by order liberal words, concepts, semantics. But then since the 2000s, we see a divergence from this. And I um, link this with the claim of a neoliberalization of European competition law that is found in the literature. This is a hypothesis and, and I try to substantiate this hypothesis with my quantitative evidence. And with what is also interesting for, for lawyers, I guess, is that there's also difference in, in the commission's arguments and in the court's arguments. And we can also capture this um, with, these, with these digital humanities methods. And I will argue that the commission um, was much more inclined to this neoliberal shift, whereas the court seems to be more traditional in its semantics and stays for a longer time um, in this realm of order liberal concepts. To make these three claims, um, I will go uh, along the following points. I, I thought I will quickly motivate this paper, why this is important. And I will also provide some background information because as I said, um, we are here in a digital humanities seminar and not in, in a legal history seminar. I will also make a, a small survey of the literature and then present my data. But the main, um, main emphasis today will be on the different methods and the results that they um, can contribute. So if we are thinking about uh, competition law, there are many reasons why one should be interested in it. Uh, lawyers are interested in the goals and in the ideas of competition law because they need that to interpret the competition norms. So European court is famous for its specific type of interpretation, which wants to know what was the purpose behind the law. So there is a lit large literature on this question. What is the goal? What is the point of the competition law um, as drafted in 1957? But there is no clear answer. And, and one way to answer is, is to look at, uh, at it from a quantitative point of view by, by mining the text. Economists are interested in it because we know that the goal of competition law affects the behavior of firms. And then finally, we as historians, we are part of a larger debate, um, as I just said, on the influence of order liberalism on the treaties. Um, so order liberalism is a school of thought that goes back to the 1930s in Germany. Um, it originated at Freiburg University. And this is why it's also sometimes called the Freiburg School. Um, and we know from the qualitative literature um, that a lot of these order liberal or Freiburg school scholars have been um, acting um, in the 50s and 60s as advisors, as, as part of the, the German delegation to the, to the treaty negotiations and so on. So we know there are some reasons to suspect that there might have been an influence of their specific language on the treaties, but we don't know this for sure. And usually this is dealt with by way of anecdotes by way of, of, of case studies, and I try to do this in a more long-term aggregate analysis. So in short, I try to answer the famous question by Borg that I have also put on the slide, what is the point of the law um, for the European case by an analyzing European competition law over the whole period of its application. Um, and to do this, um, I, I analyze 11,000 competition law decisions and judgments. So as a background, um, for me as a historian, um, mm -hmm. coming to this kind of debate was a bit surprising at first because I thought uh, in very simple terms, there's a legislator, they defined the law's purpose in 1957 when they negotiate this Treaty of Rome. And then afterwards the court simply followed this, they, they uh, applied this law 
and, and the competition for authority in this case also does the same. So this is what economists would call a simple standard principal agent model. But as I was told by lawyers, it's not that easy. Um, in, in legal reality, there's an ongoing competition for interpretative sovereignty, if you allow me this wordplay. So there are several reasons why this is the case. The, the articles in the treaty, they in general employ an open-ended language, so they need to be specified. There are also multiple internally inconsistent goals that um, the legislator had in mind when negotiating this treaty. Um, the competition law norms are standards with a dual character. So again, they need to be specified. And as a result, we see that the competition authority or the court, court um, whoever is responsible in a specific case, has to act as a shock, shock absorber to a lot of different competing ideas and goals. And it has to decide for one of these goals. And there might be a change over time because of course this marketplace of competition ideas is highly dynamic. The persons are changing in the commission. The judges are changing in the court. Of course, over time, there's also some institutional experiences that are built in the, in the commission. And of course, the phenomenon of competition itself changes. So competition in the non-digital age was very different from, from the way it is nowadays. So all of this means it's interesting to see if there are any shifts over the course of time. And as I will argue that there was one big shift. As I said in the beginning, there is already some literature on that, but um, only qualitative literature. And they have, these, these scholars have identified different kinds of goals. Um, probably the most important account comes from Gerber, who has postulated that there was a, a strong or the liberal influence on competition law in Europe. And he has um, aligned that with, with an emphasis on effective competition. There are other people who have um, tried to neutralize this thesis by saying this is just uh, the argument of a lawyer. If you look at the underlying politics, this is just a system of neo-mercantilist objectives. So, so the commission tries to just strengthen Europe by any means. And these legal considerations of effective competition, they are not so important. Others have said competition law in Europe has been a way to protect consumers. So this is another kind of um, of, of competition law goal. And sometimes this has been associated with, with the concept of work workable competition. Then Akman and Kasim have recently said, all this talk of order liberalism, it's, it's, it's not important. And from the very beginning, this has been a neoliberal system because it, was, it only cared about efficiency, economic efficiency. So again, this is another goal. And in their argument, this has been present from the very beginning. But as I will show you in a minute, it became important only later. Then a lot of uh, lawyers actually um, have argued that the only purpose has been market integration. So nothing about competition per se, but the only goal was to unite Europe in a common market. And then some more Keynesian oriented um, scholars have argued that competition law was not important at all. It was about industrial policy. So strengthening Europeans industry um, by, by, by targeting specific companies and not others. So in short, there's like a, a large literature, a lot of different goals, and we need to find out quantitatively which of these have really mattered. And to do that, we need, of course, data. In my case, this data comes from two sources. Uh, on, one, on the one hand, there's the commission who hands out decisions um, targeting specific companies. And then sometimes these decisions get appealed and then it comes to the European courts and they have to decide on the same case as well. And of course, over time, the system has become more sophisticated. The commission has increased um, the number of personnel. And we have uh, also got uh, merger control, which was not there in the beginning. So this is why we see a sharp increase of cases and decisions over time. And putting this all together, there are about 11,000 decisions and judgments that I have scraped from this official website. Um, you could wonder, has this been done before? Um, and to be honest, um, there, has, there have been some scholars doing that very recently while I was writing these chapters. But the, but the important point is that none of them captures all four pillars of competition law. So as you can see here, um, I capture Article 101, which is the article dealing with cartels. 
high capture article 102 cases. This is um, all cases dealing with abuses of a dominant position, so monopolies. And I also capture merger control and state aid, so all four pillars of competition law. Whereas all the previous attempts have specified um, only one pillar or, or, or some of them, but not all four. Another important point to make here is that even while these, some scholars have now tried to do some empirical work on this, this is usually um, done manually. So often they collect all of these cases, they don't collect the full text, and then they try to classify them by hand, saying this is an order liberal case, or this is a neoliberal case, or this goal has been important here, or the other goal. But they don't do automatic classification, and they don't do sophisticated um, corpus linguistic um, analysis. Um, so of course, this suffers from several biases, um, subjective biases, there could be human errors that uh, are unavoidable when, de when dealing with such a large number of cases. And um, while this is important, this qualitative uh, work, and I try to incorporate it, I try to complement it also with this kind of automatic analysis that we can do nowadays. So this brings me to the methods that I employ. And uh, in the title of my presentation, I say corpus linguistic methods. These are part of a larger kind of um, approach that could be summarized as text as data. And here, I think the key assumption is that the frequency of words and their concurrence in a corpus um, are interpreted in a meaningful, meaningful way. So we assume this cannot tell us something about the subliminal themes maybe even feelings, the discourses, the concepts employed. So of course, everything implicit, not captured in words is also not captured by this approach. And the goal in general is to identify interesting patterns and then try to see if we can interpret it in a meaningful way and relate it to this discourse in the literature. And in particular, um, when em employing these methods, I will show to you in a minute, I was driven by three research questions in particular. So I try to see, is there an evidence of this hypothesized or deliberate influence? Does this influence change over time? Are there any shifts? And then of course, which concepts stand out? Which words, ideas, semantics? And overall, I try to employ different, different methods with a different degree of um, complexity. I start with very simple counting and dictionary methods and then try to progress and proceed to more um, sophisticated methods, including machine learning. And usually I would present only the two or three most um, impressive uh, pieces of evidence. This is how I do it in my chapter probably. This is how, how I've done it so far when presenting this chapter to, to other audiences. But I thought in this setting, it might be interesting to compare all of the different methods that I have used and to assess which of these has been more useful, which of these has been not so useful, what are their respective advantages and disadvantages, and maybe we can discuss this afterwards in the, in the Q&A. So in a sense, I don't try to convince you with all of these methods. I will just show them each after the other, and then we can discuss um, their respective merits. So I will start with a, with a different kind of keyword extraction techniques. I will then proceed to what is called bigram analysis, where you tokenize the text into sequences of two words. And I will say in a minute why this is important in a legal setting. I then um, do some network analysis. I also do dictionary analysis. I give a short glimpse on sentiment analysis. And of course, at the end, I will, I will also give you um, an, an overview of the structural topic model that I estimated because this is one of my favorite approaches. And finally, I also give a give an short insight on a, on a prediction modeling case study that I'm still currently working on. So let me start right away with the first point, keyword extraction. So one of the main reasons why I included this in my chapter initially was that when digital humanities are nowadays used in legal history, it's usually just very simple word frequencies. So people see a, different, a specific word and they say, I want to know more about the, the temporal development. How often does this occur? Is there change over time? And then they do this word frequencies. 
And, and I did this section on keyword extraction techniques just to show legal historians that nowadays we have much more sophisticated methods for extracting keywords from text than simply looking at, at one word and its frequency. So the first thing I did was annotating this corpus with so-called parts of speech text, which allows me to say for each word, is it a noun, is it an adjective, a verb, etc. And then a simple approach is of course to look at the most frequent words and nouns instead of the most frequent words. Because as you can imagine, nouns are quite important in competition law because they tell you something about the parameters of competition. So usually the commission or the court, they would look at things like the price, at the cost, at advertising. And so there are different parameters you can play with as a, as a competitor to influence the market. And this is usually what you have to look at in a competition law case. So looking at the most frequent nouns can tell you already a lot. And in this case, we see that both the commission and the court frequently mention price, which um, is in line with, with qualitative literature that says price theoretical considerations are the most important ones in competition law. But we also see some small difference already at this stage with the commission caring mainly about physical features of a product or a service such as price or cost or other physical features, whereas the court seems to also look at effects and at competition as a process. At least that's my interpretation. And I will reinforce this argument uh, in a couple of minutes with more evidence. Then of course, you can also look at the order of words. So in which order do they appear in the text? And one way to do this is to identify collocations or co-occurrences. Collocations are words that directly follow each other. And I will do this in a minute um, with my Bikram analysis. And here, this is the second option. And um, you can identify co-occurrences, which are words which are close to one another. And here, closeness is defined as a free words distance. Um, and to get meaningful results, I, I split it here my corpus into two subcorpora, the commission uh, subcorpus and the court subcorpus. Sub and depending on the specific method, I will do this also later in other types of, of analysis. If we plot here on this slide, the most frequent co-occurrences within a free word distance for the commission corpus, um, we already get some interesting results. And I have to say here, I only use the nouns and adjectives because as I said on the previous slide, every, every word got the um, parts of speech tag. So I can do this. And we see there's one large cluster here, which seems to um, focus on the specific market that is part of the investigation. And indeed for the commission, it's always a, a huge part to define the specific market. And if we look at the words in this cluster, we see that it's defining um, this market by geography or by product and by measuring the respective companies' shares on the specific market. And by comparison, there's also a competition cluster here in the middle, and this seems to be much less central. So keep this in mind for the, for the, court, for the court network. Here we see that again, there's one big cluster, but it's not concerned with the market, but unsurprisingly in the case of a court with the law. So the court's job, is to interpret this law and apply it to the specific case. Um, and it does so by linking it to the concept of competition, which is here centrally connected with, with, with the law and is part of the, big, of the big cluster. And when doing it, it, the court seems to look at the gravity of the competition infringement and on the duration of the competition infringement. These are important concepts that are here related directly to competition. And semantically, this is, seems to be related to the word restriction, restricted competition. And here I can draw on some existing qualitative literature, which has found that whenever the court uses to refer to competition as a process, then it uses the term restriction and restricted competition. Whereas when it focuses um, on uh, competition as a, as, a, as a market structure, it doesn't use this. And this is an important difference that we will also see later in, in some other types of, of analysis. So final part of this um, keyword extraction um, is uh, calculating rapid automatic keyword extraction words um, in short rake sequences. Um, 
This is a, an algorithm that looks for contiguous sequences of words that does not contain irrelevant words. So something we would usually um, term a stop word. This is excluded here. Instead, um, the algorithm looks at sequences of words that are completely meaningful. And interestingly here, in our case, it only finds concepts that deal with market definition. So this plays into the hand of a literature that argues that nowadays market definition is the crucial feature of competition law, because the way you define the market is already saying you a lot about the outcome of the case. And from the conceptual history perspective that, that I'm doing, this is also interesting because all the liberals, they hated formal market definition and all these concepts we can see here on this slide are different ways of doing a very formal market definition. And if I'm looking more closely into my corpus, I see this is only a part of competition law since the 1990s. Um, so this is, of course, a, a, a first evidence that this audible evidence might fade away since the 1990s. With this, I come to the second piece of evidence, bicram analysis. And here, um, it is very helpful for me um, to go back into my, my qualitative archival-based work because when I did this, I realized one key feature that differentiates the order liberals from all other schools of thought is the way they characterize competition. And from this, I got the idea that looking at the adjectives accompanying competition is a very important way to trace the intellectual influences. Um, so in a sense, everyone talks about competition and very naive analysis of competition law in Europe often says, ah, there are so many words of competition and this is a very neoliberal field of law. But of course, that's besides the point because any commission official or any court judge that deals with competition law needs to use the word competition. Much more crucial is the way how he or she characterizes it. And for an economist, this is quite an, an obvious hypothesis because a lot of the concepts we have in our economics that deal with competition are actually related to these bigrams. So, for instance, the term perfect competition is a very specific bigram in economics. It deals with a specific theory. And when an economist in the commission uses it, it, he or she has a very specific theory in mind. And the same is true for all other concepts I have searched here. So when, when looking at this, at this figure, there are four points that are noteworthy. First, you see eight bigrams, but actually I searched for 11. So this means some bigrams don't, do not appear at all. And these are very audible bigrams that are associated with the German discourse. So this might be because I use the English language versions of the corpus, but it's already an interesting result that some, some of these important bigrams do not appear at all. Then the second point to note is that there's a, uh, sorry, there's a difference, a quantitative difference in the um, extent to which these bigrams appear. So of the three collocates that are relied upon continuously for all periods, effective competition seems to be by far the most prominent one, appearing almost 10 times as much as undistorted competition and free competition. It seems to have been introduced by the court very early on, and then subsequently adapted by the commission with a high number of occurrences already as early as the 1970s. And as I told you in the literature overview, effective competition can be, excuse me, directly traced to order liberals. So this is quite interesting because the treaties themselves, they don't mention the spicrum effective competition law at all. They don't mention effective competition. They mention things like fair competition or um, normal competition. So this is really a conscious um, development by the commission and by the court to use this specific concept of competition. Then, because some of the people in the literature argue that there's also neoliberal influence. I, I also searched for biograms related to neoliberalism and the Chicago school in particular. These are perfect competition and efficient competition. And as you can see on the slide, both of them are really neglectable. They don't appear at all. And then finally, another interesting thing to note is that fair competition um, appears in the treaty, but it doesn't seem to uh, be used a lot of times. I mean, in, in contrast to the neoliberal collocates, it appears continuously, but in quantitative terms, it seems to be not that important. And I think this is a very interesting finding because 
fair competition is always used in public speeches by the commissioners. Um, it seems to be a popular goal in the media, but in decisional practice of court and commission, it does not to be, uh, it doesn't appear to be very important. So this is for me one of the, the most um, interesting evidences I have, and I will come back to this point at the end. Um, the next thing I did was a network approach. So you could uh, wonder, well, sometimes they use these bigrams to talk about competition, efficient competition, perfect competition, but there must be also other words related to it. So what I did here, I did the keyword in context search um, with which I captured the 10 words um, that are immediately surrounding the word competition. And this gives me about 40,000 um, sections dealing with competition for each of the two corpuses, for the commission and for the court. And I put some example here on the slide that show this captures indeed some meaningful arguments and I, I can go into more detail in the Q&A. So the basic idea here is that there must be an underlying semantic structure that we can map as a network. So imagine there is a, a decision and it has a competition section A and it has another section B and they both use the same term when talking about competition. Then we could map this as a network. And this is what I've done um, on the next slide, starting with the commission. Um, this was one slide too much. So I start with the commission and plot this as a, as a semantic competition network. And we see there's one large component and then a couple of outliers. So, I can't go into details here, but when you zoom in and you look at different words and, 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 and look in, in, the, the, in the specific cases for their occurrence, you see that in the periphery of this network, there are several factual circumstances of the competition cases. So this deals with the specific market, the specific product, so the facts of the case. And then in the middle, there seem to be more substantial legal terms. Um, they can be found closer in the middle of the largest component. And in the case of the commission, this seems to be concerned with the notion of competitors. To get a better insight, um, I also employ a community detection algorithm to see if, if in this large um, component, there are certain communities. Um, and here, this was really um, a very uh, time consuming analysis to go into the corpus and check for these um, words that seem to form communities here. And, but what came out of this analysis that in fact, in some cases, these communities indeed represent very sophisticated complex legal te tests. So in this case, um, there seem to be three communities shown here in red, in yellow and in dark green. And in my interpretation, I can show that they are related to very um, complex tests like the um, SIEC test, um, it's, it stands for significant impediment to effective competition. And this is a, a specific test used in merger control. And um, there are also tests related to welfare effects. And there's also the so-called uh, SSNIP test. There's no time to explain them in detail. You have to believe me here now. But for me, this was quite interesting finding to see that this um, network approach seems to be able to capture very sophisticated legal te tests. And in my chapter, I relate them to specific schools of thought. Um, I also do the same for the court, but um, in, um, because uh, for lack of time, I will skip this now, but in the sense, um, I come to a similar conclusion because again, I can show that the, that the communities find by, uh, found by the community detection algorithm can be interpreted in a meaningful way. And again, related to different schools of thought. With this, I come to the dictionary analysis. A dictionary, as most of you know, is just a list of words um, or a list of patterns that can be used um, to uh, structure a lot, large corpus of texts. So in my case, of course, it has been um, intuitive to select a number of words that deal with order liberalism and with other schools of thought, and just to see how much um, are they reflected in the overall corpus. And there are two ways to do this, a manual and an automatic way. I start with the manual dictionary. So I myself um, selected um, about 50 words that I thought are important for auto liberals and for neoliberals. And then I searched for them um, in the overall corpus. 
And there are three things to notice. First, there seems to be a very similar patterns at first sight between auto liberal dictionary um, influence and neoliberal dictionary influence. And I think this is the case because when a um, specific competition case deals with matters of economic theory, the court or the commission just uses economic words, um, no matter if they relate to auto liberals or to others, they are just a certain set of words that need to be used in these cases. However, a second thing to notice is that um, in relative terms, the auto liberal dictionary um, seems to be represented a bit more, um, especially in the first four decades. And the third thing to notice is that there's a remarkably different development in the last two decades. So here, from 2000 to 2020, there seems to be a decline, whereas in exactly the same period, there's an increase um, in the neoliberal words. So of course, what I usually hear in this case is this is just a reflection of the words that I selected myself. So I also do a robustness check by constructing dictionaries from each school's respective flagship journal. So in the case of the order liberal school, there's a journal called Auto, and I digitized the whole journal from the 50s until today. So I also capture language change over time. And then I extracted the 2000 most distinctive bigrams in this journal um, and use this as a dictionary for the order liberal school. And then I do the same for the Chicago schools journal, the journal for law and economics. And again, I extract the 2000 most distinctive terms and use this as neoliberal dictionary. And at least in the order liberal case, the developments are quite similar. Whereas in the Chicago school case, um, the influence seems to be even less marginal than suggested by the manual, by the manual analysis. So again, we come to the same conclusion. There seems to be a strong order liberal language in the first four decades, and in the last two decades, it seems to have declined. Another way to do dictionary analysis is sentiment analysis, because in a sense, certain words that are associated with positive or negative feelings can be also just put in a dictionary. So um, I did here a sentiment analysis by using such a sentiment dictionary. Um, and there's one in interesting thing to note, um, whereas in the court case, the language is all, almost every, in every year negative. In the case of the commission, we seem to see a, a development from a negative language in the first four decades to a continuously positive language in the last two decades. And in my, in my thesis, I relate this again to order liberal and neoliberal thinking because in auto liberalism, competition is always discussed in very negative terms, whereas the neoliberal analysis usually contrasts positive and negative aspects of a competition infringement. It weighs these two things in a pro-contra analysis to see the overall welfare effect. And I think this is reflected here in these sentiment scores. And then as a final, as a final method, um, I used structural topic modeling. Um, Dino Wernheim has already given a very good introduction to that in, in, in last term's um, seminar. So I, I'm just saying here that this is a way of um, identifying automatically important topics and discourses uh, in the corpus. Um, and the way I do this is by using a structural topic modeling, which allows you to relate these topics also to external metadata, such as um, the institution. So in my case, commission or court and the year. And this allows us to look at temporal developments. And from an order liberal perspective, there are three topics here of particular interest. We see that price cartels, which are very important for order liberals, have been um, dealt with uh, according to the topic modeling, especially in the early decades. We also see that in these early decades, there was an emphasis on free movement. Free movement relates to the basic economic freedoms of the treaty. So this is a separate um, legal area compared to competition law, but it seems to have played a role in these early cases. And this is also something that is very close to the order liberal school because they had a very comprehensive understanding of competition. And then finally, there's a topic that um, seems to capture the transaction-based vocabulary of the Chicago neoliberal school. And this topic seems to have been only uh, important since the 2000s. So again, stressing my argument that there's been a shift. 
As I said, structural topic modeling also allows you to um, reflect on the influence of um, the institutional meta variable. In my case, is it the commission or the court dealing with a certain case? And again, we see that the other liberal topic, the free movement topic, is very much related um, with the court, whereas the transaction topic um, uh, that is close to neoliberal thought is related to the commission. So this again um, also underlines the argument that the commission seems to have experienced this neoliberal shift, but the court stayed more true to the order liberal language. And finally, there's one method um, that I'm still in the moment exploring. So this is uh, in contrast to the six other methods, not a final analysis. Um, here, I used my order liberal dictionary um, to classify each case as being order liberal or not, um, depending whether it contained words of this order liberal dictionary or not. And then I used the naive bias classifier to calculate the probability that the decision or judgments would be based on order liberal language. <clears throat> and then, based on this, I was able to look at the key words that the classifier used to distinguish between an order liberal and a non order liberal case um, argument. And if we look at the words here, most of them are very intuitive. Interestingly, they are not included in my order liberal dictionary, which means it's a kind of a nice robustness check because I think these words can be related to order liberal thought, but they don't help me very much in explaining the shift. So I use this as a robustness check so far for my dictionary analysis, but there I see no way in the moment how I can relate this to these temporal shifts that I'm mainly interested in. So um, coming to uh, the conclusion, um, as I said, I want to focus here on the methodological points. And as we have just seen on the last slide, to me, it seems that the most sophisticated methods are not necessarily the most instructive ones for legal historians. So there seems to be a big role played by contextual knowledge. In my case, I was aware that the adjectives and the bigrams used to characterize competition are very important. So a simple bigram analysis, uh, searching for these collocates was very helpful and told me a lot. Whereas the more complicated machine learning um, approach was more difficult to relate to the discussions in the literature. Um, especially because I didn't see a way how to um, uh, insert the element of time. So this would be my, my methodological insights, and I would be very happy to discuss them with you now in a, in a, in a bit more detail. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>